So hello and good afternoon. It's great to see many of you again. And to the new folks who are just joining these monthly partner calls, welcome. There are a few homeowners with us here today. Um, we welcome you as well, and we're happy to have you here. We encourage you to glean as much as you can from this presentation and keep in mind that the slides were created for our partner organizations. We look forward to hosting more webinars specifically for homeowners in the coming months. My name is Lori Jacobs and I'm joined here with Stephanie Griffin and Reginald Givens. Um, out of respect for your, for your time, we are getting started. And I just want to let everyone know that you have been muted for this presentation. We do invite your questions and comments through the chat and Q&A box. These questions and comments will be addressed or answered throughout the presentation, as well as at the end during a question and answer period. If we do not get to your questions this afternoon or your questions are specific to an individual situation or scenario, um, we'll be sending out a follow up email that will capture the Q&A and provides responses or referrals as needed. Please keep in mind that this presentation is being recorded, so please be respectful and considerate of others while on the webinar and while providing comments. The recording as well as the PowerPoint will be shared in a follow up email as well as on the agency's COVID-19 resource websites. We truly hope that by the end of this presentation, you feel educated and confident to educate others about the Delaware Mortgage Relief Program. The agenda will include a brief update on the program development process, a review of the documentation required from homeowners, as well as provide ample time for question and answer. I will end this brief housekeeping portion of the webinar by plugging the Delaware Mortgage Relief dis Distribution List by attending this webinar, you will be automatically subscribed. However, if you know anyone who could benefit from the program or the information that we're sharing here today, please encourage them to sign up via email. The email distribution list is the most efficient way to receive updates on this program, as well as mortgage assistance broadly. I will gladly place the email sign up link in the chat. And at this time, I am going to hand over the floor to Stephanie and Reginald Givens to discuss the pilot program. It's all yours, team. Thanks, Lori. Hi, everyone. I am Stephanie Griffin, and I am the Director of Housing Finance for the Delaware State Housing Authority. Um, we are very happy to have you here to discuss our progress on this uh, program. And um, at this point, we're also very excited to announce that the pilot program has been up and running for about three weeks. Um, it launched shortly after our last partner call. So the agency did target current DSHA mortgage holders to participate in our pilot. Um, these individuals were identified as delinquent or facing foreclosure by our master servicer. The pilot will run until DSHA meets its established metrics, which include a number of loan services, uh, a, num a, a certain number of loan servicers that have been onboarded, a diversity in the cases that have been um, submitted or have applied. And then there's a few other metrics that we've internally identified, such as um, adding additional support staff as we roll out the full program. Um, so we actually encourage you to please keep an eye out on our job postings and our board and encourage people to apply as you see those posted. There is no set end date for the pilot program at this point, as our goal with the pilot is to ensure a quality efficient program for all involved. Once we roll out the full program, um, we just want it to run as smoothly as possible. Once we, we open it up to the general public for um, applicants in the state of Delaware. So next, we'd like to discuss the timeline a little bit. Um, DSHA has made significant progress and is on track to roll out our program statewide this summer. So we're in the final stages of receiving all of the necessary approvals. Um, and as Lori mentioned, the best way to receive the statewide rollout news is to subscribe to the email distribution list. Um, as you can see from this timeline, we have updated it a little bit. Um, we have submitted the plan. We have built the program um, and our pilot pro program has launched. So we are, we are getting very close to that full rollout. 
Um, so initial lessons learned from the pilot. So three weeks is not a lot of time, but it has already provided us with some really significant insight and ways to improve the experience for all of our applicants moving forward um, and for our, some of our other partners. Um, for loan servicers, and I know there are a few on this call, um, we are working to onboard you as quickly as possible and to onboard as many as possible prior to the full rollout. So we request that you complete your onboarding as soon as possible. Um, applications will stall and the payments will not be rendered if we don't have you onboarded, which is why we just want to be as proactive with that piece as possible. So onboarding instructions have been sent out via email. If you have not received communication or you are looking for more information or to actually be onboarded, you can email the DEMRP servicers at DEStateHousing.com email and we will get that information over to you as quickly as possible. Um, I believe Lori is also going to put that email address in the chat so you can access it. So if you just drop an email with your contact information and with the necessary um, other contacts for your your um, entity, we will get that information over to you to initiate that process as quickly as possible. And Stephanie, before you transition, may I interject something? Of course, no, please. No, thank you. And, and it's my pleasure to be here and to support um, the state of Delaware in this effort. As Lori said, my name is Reg and I'm a consultant working uh, with the program. But I just wanted to say directly to the mortgage servicers on the call, and I happen to notice one in particular that um, we've reached out to if you can at least initially respond, acknowledging that you've received the information and give us some sense of when we might hear again, that's really helpful because it'll prevent us from continue to follow up with you, but it'll also give us a sense of, okay, they have it and we know it's in process because we know that 50 states are launching these programs. And so as mortgage servicers, you're not just responding to us, you're responding to us and 49 others. So I only wanted to put that out there for you. No, that's excellent advice. Thanks, Ranj. I appreciate that. Um, and we are going to, there is documentation for the services that is required. Um, so the email will provide some guidance on the best ways to um, send that information back to us or to even directly upload it to the to our, our Yardy portal. So all of that information will be contained in that service or email. Um, so the goal was to make that as, as straightforward and clean as possible. So that is the best way to sort of um, initiate this process for anyone that wants to onboard with us. Okay, um, so switching over to homeowners, we have noticed two trends with the um, applicants, the homeowner applicants that we have received through the pilot at, up to this point. Um, and they, they appear to be very connected to one another. So the first one is to double check the income eligibility. Um, Lori is actually gonna put a link in the chat and it will be available at the DECOVIDHousinghelp.com website. Um, we are seeing that applicants um, are either not providing the information or um, are unclear as to how, to how to provide that information, but that is a key piece to moving forward. And then the second piece is that we um, we're encouraging applicants to organize and prepare all of the required documentation prior to applying. Um, so that, of course, directly ties to having the necessary documentation for the income eligibility piece. So our case auditors and our review auditor, reviewers have noted that 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 seems to be one of the places where we are seeing um, seeing the most um, delays in the application process. But our case reviewers and auditors do follow up if they have questions. Um, but if you have it ready to go, it will just make everything run so much smoother and we won't have to um, go back and forth and try and collect all that information after the fact. So uh, DSHA has created a document checklist. It can be downloaded by anyone who is interested. Um, Lori will also put that in the link in the chat so that and it can be sent out um, through a follow up email. So we do not talk about documentation on our last call for the applicants, so we wanted to quickly run through that with you all now. Um, so the identity documentation is pretty straightforward. Um, we do require a driver's license or a state issue ID. Um, the key to remember with this is that the address of the applicant must be reflected on this document. Um, and the address, of course, must also be owned and occupied by the applicant. Um, so that documentation is, is one of the starting points, and that's the key information with that is to 
make sure that that address is included. Um, the required income documentation. So this will um, tie back to the last piece that we were sort of talking about with what we've noticed with the applicants. Um, there are a list of accepted income documentation. It's on the um, screen right now. It's tax returns, pay stubs, self-employment income, pension or annuity, social security, any rental or border income, alimony or child support, unemployment benefits, VA benefits, or any other income-based benefits that the applicant may be receiving. The most common are the tax returns and pay stubs, which we would require to be the most recent pay stubs, two most recent pay stubs, and the most recent tax return. Um, but any and all applicant, applicable documents should be submitted to your, um, as part of your application process to ensure that the participant qualifies. If you remember, the program has two elements. It's the fresh start and the emergency displacement um, tracks, but both of them do require that there be income documentation submitted. So we would require that regardless of the track that you are seeking assistance. And Stephanie, um, if I may here. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, thank you. And I would say the housing counseling partners or you know, mortgage services, which I'm sure are aware um, but consumers as well, right? When you look at this required documentation, it's always as applicable. So sometimes people will think, well, I don't have this or I don't have that. But you also want to think about, do I need this or that in order to document or share my situation, right? And so um, when you're not self-employed, then you wouldn't have anything for that. But sometimes people think, well, I don't have a, a profit and loss statement or um, my tax returns maybe for last year aren't complete or aren't finished, but I have current pay stubs. So you're looking for, what applies to you and what will communicate to the program your situation. Yes, thank you, Reg. That's excellent. Um, and we do just we want to remind you that the financial hardship is an eligibility requirement for the program. So one of the things that we will be looking for as part of this documentation is um, just something to support the loss of income or increased expenses that an applicant may be experiencing. So. Um, the goal of this program is also to ultimately create a sustainable long term solution for the homeowner, and we would do this by working with the servicer to bring the mortgage current and also to right size the monthly payments um, in instances where the debt to income ratio exceeds the certain thresholds that we've identified. So, when a homeowner, um, so by doing that, we hope that the homeowner can successfully maintain their mortgage payments moving forward. So we do want to highlight that any applicant who does not have any source of income will be referred to housing counseling to explore what other options may be available to them because this program cannot um, support them in that long-term sustainable goal. So, um, anything else you want to add to the income piece, Reg, before we move on? No, I think that's good. Thank you. Okay. Well, and I would say this, right? Which I'm sorry, are you speaking? Uh, Reg, we can't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me? It's very quiet. Nope. Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. Well, um, maybe he can put that maybe he can put whatever he was gonna say into the chat or when his sound comes back, we can we can circle back to that. Um <clears throat> but we'll move on to the required verification uh documentation. So these, as you can see on the screen, there's a list of items that are required as part of the submission. Um, the, we need to have evidence of ownership and outstanding expenses. So that's gonna be um, the most recent statement as well as um, any kind of documentation that will verify the ownership of the property. Um, this is where an applicant would work with their loan servicer through um, the online, online portal. Um, when we speak to any utility assistance, um, that is only for water and sewer. So um, we are seeing that some folks are trying to apply for assistance for other forms of utility, but our program does not support that. They only support delinquencies tied to water and sewer. We do also support delinquencies tied to um, HOAs and condo fees or property taxes and insurance statements. We would require some foreclosure documentation. Um, again, that would be just a um, 
something from the loan servicer that shows that the that you are at least 30 days delinquent, the applicant um, being the you are 30 days delinquent. And then there is an attestation form and a third party authorization form. Those are actually built into the portal. So there's a certification that you that the applicant will electronically sign that is verifying that all of the information that they have provided is accurate um, and that it meets the requirements of the program. So that is something that is listed on a lot of our documentation, but we just want to make sure that we're clear that that is actually electronically signed through the portal. Um, so it's not a document that we would expect anyone to download and sign and, and upload to the portal. Um, so I think there's been some confusion there. So we just wanted to clarify that piece. Um, and so with that, I think we'll take a second to pause and see if there's any questions around any of the information we presented so far with regard to the income documentation, the pilot program, the timelines, any of this, any anything like that. And while you pause, I'll see if you can hear me. We can hear you. Yes. <laughs> Great. All right, all right. I was making some adjustments. And just for the record, I was going to comment regarding the income eligibility piece, right? And so you may have heard the reference to AMI or area median income. And so there is a maximum allowable income for individuals that are determined to be eligible for assistance through the program. But what I wanted to um, stress to those on the call and to have you share with others, right? At one point, a consumer may have been over that number in the past, but currently you're within that number. And that's where, when I was referring to what's most reflective of your current situation being the documentation you want to provide. And so current pay stubs may reflect that when prior year tax returns might indicate you were over, but now you're no longer there. So. That's great. Thank you, Reg. That's great context. Okay, so our first question in the chat is, how can one join the pilot program? <laughs> so, question. I said we both paused there. The, the pilot, as you may have heard Stephanie mentioned um, earlier in the conversation, are loans that are serviced by DSHA's master servicer. And so if your loan isn't serviced by them, you wouldn't be there, but that's simply to give us the initial brush of cases that will allow us to test the systems and the processes. And as soon as we move through that, it will open to the general public at large. So there's no opting into the pilot because it is a um, controlled population based upon the master servicer relationship, but that won't go on longer than necessary and then it will be open to the public at large. Yes, and I will also add that um, if you are part of the pilot, you would have received communications from the, our loan servicer or the agency itself, and that communication would have occurred via email, and that email communication was sent in the past two weeks. So next question. What about the opposite case where someone may have had low income leading to mortgage delinquency and now their income is greater, perhaps exceeding the max? That is a great question. As the program is designed, it would not allow for the assistance. However, I would say to the individual <clears throat> to reach out to your um, mortgage servicer first and foremost, right? Because that hardship from the past might make you eligible for something the servicer is able to provide you, but the program requires that income be within the eligibility limits presently at the time of the assistance. What is the name of DSHA's servicer? Our master servicer is Lakeview. Yeah, so if your mortgage statement says Lakeview, and it may say um, serviced by somebody else, but it'll clearly have the Lake View um, branding on it, then you would be a part of the um, pilot applications. And you could reach out to Lake View and ask them directly about it or reach out to the state. <clears throat> Thank you. What if they have money to put towards the arrears? Um, so, so the difference um, from the emergency fund would cover, I'll see if you guys can read that question. And I, Yeah, I see it <laughs> and I think I understand it. So it's what if I have money to put toward the arrears so that the difference from the emergency funds would cover the difference. So we'll use an example of the maximum assistance allowed is 25,000, but the delinquency is 30. 
I understand the person to be asking if I have the five, would I be able to still receive the assistance from the state? My response would be yes. Procedurally, I would say you want to do this because it's not something the state asks or would have the ability to know. You first apply for the assistance. And then you will be evaluated for your eligibility based on your occupancy, property location, income limit, hardship, and eligible loan. Those are universal for eligibility. And when it gets to evaluating you for the assistance, the program would say your delinquency exceeds the eligible limits. In that, you would be able to respond and provide documentation. I always like to say, showing me what you're saying helps me see what you mean would then allow the program to see, okay, they're delinquent 30,000, the program only goes up to 25, but they're appealing, asking for reconsideration, expressing that they have access to the additional five and providing documentation that the state would say, yes, you can provide that to your servicer and combine that with the state's assistance to get current. The goal of the program is to help households not only get current, as Stephanie said, with the fresh start, but to have sustainability, a payment that we believe they can maintain into the future. And so there's always some exceptional circumstances, as you will, that would allow for that, that is not clearly evident to the program. And so when you get the initial response, responding to that with that additional information and documentation puts us in a position to be able to meet our objective. So yes, long answer short. <laughs> <laughs> Um, next question, how is the maximum allowable income determined per household? Another good question. The AMI or area median income is first and foremost established by the um, HUD, the U.S. Department of Urban Housing and Development, and they have a half for the Homeowners Assistance Fund, AMI, and that is driven by household size and county, so it can vary. So depending on the county that you live in and the number of members in your household, the maximum amount is determined. And then household income, as was previously stated, I think by Stephanie, for all household members age 18 and over is taken into consideration when calculating the total household income to determine is it within the eligible limit. So size and location. The county I live in and the number of household members in the house. Is there any update on treasury approval? There, there is, um, we have actually submitted everything and we have had um, a few back and forth with them. And we anticipate having our formal approval, um. Any day, so um, we, we anticipate that we are very, very close with all of that information. So expect an announcement on that very shortly. <laughs> yes, and that announcement will be via press release as well as that email distribution list, which we encourage you to sign up for. Okay, um, I believe we covered this at the top, but I see it again, and that is when will the pilot program end? The so pilot again, will end, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Stephanie was saying, the, the pilot is anticipated to end once the program operationally has achieved certain metrics, right? Evaluating assistance for different elements of the program, delivering that assistance to different servicers within the program, and then a, a few other internal factors um, that the program is evaluating in order to ensure we're best positioned to take on what we hope will be um, a slew of applications from households desiring assistance. How will participants know if their loan servicer has or has not been onboarded? You, um, as an individual applying, do not need to concern yourself with that, though I appreciate someone asking that. Programmatically, we will reach out um, to the servicers in order to complete that setup. And in the event, and I should say in the unlikely event that a loan servicer will not participate, because it is highly unlikely, but sometimes you know, there's an exception to every rule, then the program would communicate that to the applicant that their servicer um, is refusing to participate. Um, and then you could take that out, but it's highly unlikely that that would occur. But most importantly, you don't even need to concern yourself with whether or not that has occurred because programmatically as individuals apply and we encounter 
mortgage servicers that have not yet been onboarded. We are actively outreaching to them in order to complete that process presently. And when we receive applicants from consumers, that helps to stimulate that even more. Because we can say to them, now we have a mutual customer in process. We really need your support in pushing this along. And again, they too um, want to see mortgage loans brought current. And so they'll do everything that they can to assist with that onboarding process. Okay. Um, next question. I see a few. Where can I send someone who needs immediate assistance? For instance, they may lose their home by the end of the month. Um, I can start by saying that we do have additional resources on the DE COVID Housing Help website. That's decovidhousinghelp.com. And um, we also recommend you working with a local housing counselor to ensure that all avenues have been exhausted. That list is also on the DE COVID Housing Help website. Um, and then I would also just ask all of you amazing people on the call um, if you have capacity and or recommendations as to where homeowners can term that you share that information with the agency DSHA so that we can also either promote it or, or send it out as needed. And I'll just add to that, Lori, one other thing. I trust the individual asking the question if it applies to them or someone they know has done this, but sometimes it's surprising what people have it. Make sure you check with your mortgage servicer, right? Because you want to indicate to them that you live in the state of Delaware, that you know this program is being um, stood up and about to launch, that you want to ensure that they're aware and they're participating because you can help drive that, and that you anticipate making application because that will probably garner you some favor with them to the extent that they can to give you time to still make that application, get evaluated, and see if assistance is available. So remember, always communicate with your mortgage service. The major key to any successful relationship is communication. Do it with every party you know how. Okay. Where can we find a list of the agency's master servicers? It's just Lakeview. There is no list. So um, master servicers, Lakeview, the master servicer can subservice to others, but that's not the that's not the um, piece that sort of identifies who's eligible for the pilot. It is that master servicer, and that is only Lakeview. Okay. For homeowners that were past due prior to January 2020, but the reason for delinquency was compounded by COVID, will they still be able to use half funds? Homeowners that were passed through prior to January 2020, but the reason for delinquency was compounded by COVID. Forgive me, not that there's an echo. Reading is sometimes helps me process it. <laughs> Will they still be eligible for half funds? It is quite possible. The first thing I would say is I would say to anyone um, needing assistance or anyone sharing with someone needing assistance, apply. Right, because when you apply, the program gets an opportunity to do what it's there for, and that is evaluate you for eligibility. So I would never want to preemptively discourage your apply. Apply. Um, say a applicant does not have access to a scanner for these documents. Can they take a picture with their phone, or what forms are acceptable in the application? You can, and the application portal will support um, mobile devices, so you can take a picture and it'll upload right then. Um, obviously, online or computer devices, and you can upload them from a desktop um, as well. Um, and then there's call center support um, that you could actually call the call center in the event that you really got down to paper. <laughs> we would find a way to get those documents because, as was stated previously, our goal is to provide assistance where possible. Yes, and I will also mention that our amazing local libraries have access to com computers and scanners as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And thank you, Lisa, from the DOJ Office of Foreclosure and Prevention. I'll be sure that that information gets out in the follow up email. Uh, let's see if we have another question. It's just one. Where can I find the archived recording of these partner calls? Um, so the recordings will be sent out in the follow up email following each calls, but they are also archived on the agency's YouTube page and I'm happy to put that link in the chat.
If you have any additional questions, please feel free to place them in the chat or the Q and A. How are applications prioritized? Hmm. That's a good question. Do I still have audio? I had to mute because I had some background noise. I want to make sure I was still okay. Great. Um, <clears throat> the applications are prioritized systematically and applicants in need of foreclosure um, assistance in the sense that they have a scheduled date. Um, those receive priority initially um, under 15 days because time is of the essence. And that really will help us operationally to evaluate those cases and, and do what we can. It does require that the applicant upload supporting documentation because some people will think they're in foreclosure when they've only received a notice that they could go into foreclosure. And then others have thought, oh, they're in foreclosure when they've received a notice that the property sold through foreclosure, right? So you see it both ways, but they're prioritized based on foreclosures within 15 days, foreclosures over 15 days. Um, and then by income area, median income is a secondary um, prioritization criteria, right? Because those with limited income have fewer options in order to get expedited through processing. Will the agency share any details about the pilot program? For instance, how many people participated from each county or demographic information? Um, so the agency is collecting data on the pilot program and will share it at a later date. We will also be collecting data on the full program, which we will um, provide regular updates on amount distributed, number of households assisted on the mortgage relief website as well. If the delinquent amount exceeds the limit of the grant, can the homeowner make up the difference with their own funds? I was waiting to go, oh yeah, we addressed that before. No, but y'all, yes, we addressed that before. Uh, remember, initially the program will not know that the homeowner has the ability to do that. So the initial response might be an ineligibility notice based upon the amount of delinquency exceeding the available grant. But the homeowner, every homeowner has an opportunity to appeal the decision. And ultimately, I will say for clarification on that, an appeal should provide one of two things, either clarification for misinformation previously provided or additional documentation for information not previously provided. But ultimately, it should be something new and different that changes what was previously disclosed and reviewed. And so that would be, hey, I see I was ineligible because it exceeded the available grant. I have the ability to make up the difference. Here's proof. Can I be approved? And that would be, give us the opportunity to say yes. Okay. I'll give a few seconds for any last minute questions on program details before we move into next steps. Again, we really appreciate the conversation and all of these questions will be captured in um, a document which will be attached to the follow up email. Um, so we'll have the recording and you'll also have um, a bit of a live transcript of these answers as well. So I'll go ahead and share my screen again. So we thank you all for attending today. The July monthly partner call will be on July 14th at 3 p.m. I can place the registration link in the chat now mm -hmm. so that you can get it on saved on your calendar early. Again, all of these partner calls are being recorded and are available on um, the agency's YouTube page. In terms of where we really could use your help and where we would love to have everyone tap into. So for our, our, our outreach partners, um, those who are eager to share the news about the program and help us share news about the program. We really are encouraging homeowners to download the document checklist. As you've heard from Steph and Reg, documents are crucial to this application process. And the earlier they are organized and prepared and, upload and uploaded, the more efficient the application process will be for the homeowners. We have had great success with this checklist so far. Um, we have about 
50 homeowners downloading it a day. So we're really, we're really happy to have it as a resource and are eager to, to see how it helps with the program. Um, and then for those who were at our last call or listened to our last call, you know that we have a homeowner representative partner level. And this is just a reminder, a homeowner representative can apply on behalf of another person. For instance, your aunt is having trouble with her mortgage. You, uh, you want to apply on behalf of your aunt. You can do that. And that is called the homeowner representative partner. And we have trainings running weekly every Wednesday at 1 p.m. through our software provider, Yardi, to train homeowner representatives on the portal and expectations and sort of give a taste of what homeowner reps will see and experience during this process. Again, these happen weekly at 1 p.m. And I will place that Zoom registration in the chat as well. And then for our amazing housing counselors, we will be putting out an RFP in the coming months. If you have questions about it or just really want to make sure that you're on the list to receive it, you can feel free to reach out to me. I'll place my email in the chat. So I'll also leave this up for a few seconds and see if there are any final questions on next steps. I do see one. What is the easiest way to apply on the website? I went on and had a hard time finding the program. Yes. So in the next week, as in the next week, we will be updating the website, specifically the mortgage page, to have more significant information, be easier to use, and really get you where you need to go in, in terms of applications. Um, this new website will launch relatively soon. However, the Apply Now button will, will not be available until the statewide program opens. But we do anticipate having a refreshed website for, for easier use in the next week. I appreciate that question. I was just going to say in looking at that partnership level, right? So I always think of outreach as making people aware. Um, homeowner rep is supporting people in the effort and then the housing counselor is assisting them through the process, right? And so somebody asking, you know, how do I apply or how can I find it is saying, hey, accessibility isn't as easy as we would like it to be. But to Lori's point, right, we're going to make it easier, especially once we get into a full launch. So we're not there yet, but I definitely appreciate that question. So thank you. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. If at any point during the process, any point during the rollout or in preparation for the rollout, you feel as if the communications aren't clear or could be improved, again, please email me. I love feedback, so <laughs> I'd be very happy to hear from you. Okay, so one last call for questions. Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks everyone.